Well, good morning, and it's very nice to be able to be in Asheville, North Carolina. It's the first time I've been here, and uh, I know a lot about this conference. Uh, Steve Wyatt uh, invited me last year, but my schedule didn't allow me to be here, but I heard a lot from him about who's at this conference and the importance of this conference to addiction medicine. So I'm very glad to have the opportunity to, to speak with you this morning and, and tell you something about what we're doing at a federal level and how we try to work with our states around addressing uh, various issues as they relate to addictions. What I'm going to talk about this morning is I'm going to kind of give you an overview of, of where we're at in terms of the prevalence of mental and substance use disorders in the United States. Uh, and then I'm going to really shift and talk about the opioids crisis, which is a terrible national tragedy, but one that requires us to put in place a system that will work for our people now who suffer with opioid use disorder and for those in the future that will have problems with substance use disorders. So I will talk about the role of the federal government as well as state governments, communities, families, and individuals. So this is data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health from 2017. That's the most recent year that we have data for. Um, we are always a year behind. Uh, but here's what we learned about mental and substance use disorders uh, in the United States at that time. So we know that nearly 19% of Americans, over 46 million Americans, uh, meet diagnostic criteria for a mental disorder. Of those people, 24% have what we call a serious mental disorder, a mental disorder of a severity that it impairs their daily lives. Um, people with bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorders, very serious mental disorders, and that's a very large number of people, over 11 million Americans. We also know that 7.6 million, or 7.6%, over 18 million Americans met diagnostic criteria for substance use disorder. Uh, the majority of those, 75%, have alcohol use problems, 36% illicit drug use problems, and 11.5% alcohol and illicit drug use disorders. We know that co-occurring conditions are quite common. 8.5 million Americans uh, meet criteria for both a mental and substance use disorder. This is very important because uh, individuals who have those co-occurring disorders will not fully recover if they don't get care and treatment for both conditions. And despite this very large number, millions of Americans living with mental and substance use disorders, we have tremendous treatment gaps. Again, data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health tells us that only 8% of people with substance use disorders get treatment for those disorders. 57% of Americans with mental illnesses do not get treatment for those illnesses. For people who have serious mental illness, 33% of them, 33% get no treatment whatsoever. People with co-occurring disorders, again, 92% of them do not get treatment. And when we look at our children, 12 to 17-year-olds, uh, we see that 58% of 12 to 17-year-olds with major depression did not get treatment for that serious condition. So we have a lot of work to do in this country uh, to prepare providers and our healthcare systems to do a better job of providing the care and treatment that our people need for these conditions. The opioids crisis is the greatest public health emergency related to addiction in our lifetimes probably ever in this country. Um, we know that 11.4 million Americans are misusing opioids. We know that over 2 million Americans meet criteria for an opioid use disorder. 55% got treatment for a heroin use disorder, 21% for prescription pain reliever use disorders. So again, majority of people with these use disorders are not getting the care and treatment that they need. We had in 2017 over 70,000 drug overdose deaths and two thirds of those deaths were related to heroin use uh, and synthetic opioids. Synthetic opioids, uh, such as fentanyl, carfentanyl, 
these, um, these substances uh, are frequently contaminating the heroin supplies in our country right now. Um, what this uh, slide shows you is that from 2013 moving forward, you can see the steep upward trajectory of DEA seizures of illicit fentanyl brought into this country and tracking with that the increase in deaths from opioid overdose. Uh, on the right side of the slide, I hope it's your right, the, the maps of the country, uh, you see uh, relatively few seizures of fentanyl in 2001, but by 2015, those darkening colors, those are big increases in the number of seizures of illicit fentanyl being brought into the United States. And we know from CDC data that, that risk for fentanyl exposure is highly linked to heroin use. And we also know that non-medical use of prescription opioids is a significant risk factor for becoming a heroin user. 75% of people who used heroin in the past year misused prescription opioids first, and 70% of people who used heroin in the past year also misused prescription opioids in the past year. So these two things are linked, and there are consequences to that. Over two million Americans with opioid use disorder. This is data from a couple of studies. I thought it was interesting to just take a quick look at kind of how things have evolved around, uh, around heroin use. This is a study from Mahuri and colleagues uh, back in 2011, so they looked at the, the years uh, just prior to 2011, and, and in their study they said 3.6% of non-medical users of prescription opioids had initiated heroin use within five years of starting to misuse prescription opioids. That gave them, they calculated an initiation rate for heroin of less than 1% per year. And, and they identified some risk factors, frequent non-medical use of opioids, uh, prescription opioid uh, abuse or dependence, uh, and a history of injection drug use. Uh, Carlson and colleagues uh, reported on more recently in 2016, so the few years leading up to their publication, they followed uh, a cohort of 18 to 23 year olds, so young adults, and they followed them for three years. And they found that 7.5% initiated heroin use, these were misusers of prescription opioids, initiated heroin use over 36 months. They calculated an initiation rate of 2.8% per year. And their risk factors, uh, not so different from Mahuri, uh, prescription opioid dependence, an early age of initiation, non-oral roots of abuse, and only using prescription opioids to get high. So these were not people that started using prescription opioids because they had a pain problem. These were people who were misusing prescription opioids for the effect of prescription opioids. But what this shows is the increase in that conversion over to heroin and particularly troubling what's happening in our young adults. This is uh, data from the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. This is a, a um, survey, a set of questions that has been asked every year since 2006. Uh, and what these questions ask about is if you are a person who has said you're misusing prescription opioids, um, where are you getting, where are you getting those prescribed opioids that you're misusing? And every year since 2006, we've seen basically the same results. 53% say, I get them free from my friends and relatives. And another 37% say, one prescriber, one doctor, one nurse practitioner, one physician assistant prescribed me so much opioids that I had enough to misuse. So, I know we have a lot of clinicians in this room, perhaps uh, all of you are clinicians. We need to do a better job of educating our peers about overprescribing because the medical community, we remain the problem. This is 2017 data. We have to do a better job. And there are consequences to this overprescribing. Again, National Survey on Drug Use and Health, 2017, 11.4 million people are misusers of opioids. That's 4% of our adult population. Now, the good news is that's a significant decrease from 2015, where we had a peak of 12.7 million misusers. But 
I don't think any of us should be happy that 11.4 million Americans are misusing opioids. And of that 11.4 million, 11.1 million, the great majority, are misusers of prescription opioids. The deaths that we see are from heroin, mainly fentanyl, synthetic opioids that are illicit. But the majority of opioid misuse is still, is still prescribed opioids. 886,000 heroin users, 562,000 people using both prescription opioids illicitly and heroin. People who will probably go on to become sole heroin users as their, as their problem escalates out of control and heroin being a less expensive alternative to prescribed opioids. But again, the majority of people that are misusing are misusing prescription opioids. So what does all this tell us? It tells us that most opioid misuse and use disorders remain in those that are misusing prescribed opioid pain relievers. And that prescribers continue to be a major part of the problem. We lack public and patient education and awareness about the addictive potential and the danger of prescription opioid misuse. That's a continuing problem in our country. We have to not only educate our providers, but we have to tell our people about the fact that chronic opioid therapies, there's very little evidence of effectiveness and there are substantial risks. Heroin and illicit opioid pills contaminated by fentanyl and other potent opioids remain the main reason for the majority of opioid overdose deaths. And we also know that too many people do not get treatment for these disorders. 45% got no treatment for their heroin use disorder. 79% of people with prescription pain reliever use disorders got no treatment. And why do they not get treatment? Uh, uh, there, there are a number of reasons for that. The stigma of the illness itself, a lack of resources, a lack of providers, and a lack of evidence-based treatment and recovery supports in communities. So those are all things that, that we are trying to work on at a federal level and at a state level. I'll talk a little bit about that. So, th so we have a federal response. We have uh, what we call our five-point opioid strategy, which is to strengthen public health surveillance uh, to advance the practice of pain management, to make it safer and more effective, um, to improve access to treatment and recovery services, and to uh, provide naloxone to communities and training to first responders, individuals, and family members about the use of naloxone, uh, the opioid uh, overdose uh, reversing agent, and supporting new research, new research that will look for alternatives to opioids as pain relievers, and uh, more potent uh, formulations of naloxone to help to reverse those overdoses that are, that are uh, the result of a fentanyl exposure or a carfentanyl exposure. I'm sure you've all heard the stories of multiple, multiple doses of naloxone to, to uh, reverse an overdose. We'd like to see more potent formulations. Uh, this is SAMHSA's plan to address the opioids crisis. We have a number of uh, programs. Uh, SAMHSA is the main federal agency that is, that is providing the resources to communities and to states uh, related to uh, prevention, treatment, and recovery services in communities. We have the state targeted response grants. These are grants to the states that were a result of the 21st Century Cures Act. That was $500 million a year uh, for fiscal year 17 and 18. Uh, last year, the last fiscal year in 2018, uh, Congress and the President agreed on another $1 billion that again went to the states to provide services to communities affected by this crisis. In fiscal year 19, we have a program that we now call the State Opioid Response, and in that what has happened is the STR money, that 500 million, plus that extra 1 billion have been combined. So we have $1.5 billion again in 2019 that is going to states and communities to combat the opioids crisis. Um, these dollars uh, sponsor public outreach, prevention, education, treatment, and recovery services. 
The states decide on what is needed within their jurisdictions. At the federal level, we're not going to tell North Carolina what's going on in your state and what you need to do. Your state needs to decide that and work with all of you to figure out how you're going to address the opioids problem for, with your people. We have a program on naloxone access. Uh, we train first responders. We, we train peer uh, specialists. Uh, and uh, that is a, a program that uh, is national and has received increased funding uh, for fiscal year 19. We have a program called Matt Padoa. That is a program that uh, helps the states <clears throat> and, and other types of um, treatment programs to implement medication-assisted treatment. Medication-assisted treatment, of course, course, and I'm sure you know this, but I'll just say it, uh, this is the use of methadone, buprenorphine, injectable naltrexone, those medications that are FDA approved for the treatment of opioid use disorder. That's the standard of care. That's what we want to see happening in the treatment of people with opioid use disorder. We have a program for pregnant and postpartum women who have opioid use disorder. This is a program that we were able to expand with the passage of the CARA Act. Uh, previously, that program existed in the form of residential treatment for women and their families who had substance use disorders, including opioid addiction. Now, with the CARA Act passage, we have both residential and outpatient treatment programs. There are many women affected by opioids that cannot go into residential programs. And so we want to give these women uh, as much choice as possible about what works best for them and their families so that they can get the care and treatment they need and provide for their families. We have criminal justice programs uh, that use medication-assisted treatment. We have drug courts for adults, uh, juvenile, and family drug courts. Uh, we also have a, a fairly small but really important offender reentry program. We know that people who have a history of opioid use disorder coming out of jails or prisons are quite vulnerable if they relapse to opioids to overdose and death. This program works to assist those people to get onto appropriate therapy for their opioid use disorder and into clinical care as they are getting ready to leave incarceration. We have in reinstated the Drug Abuse Warning Network. Um, this is a program that uh, emergency departments around the country report to uh, SAMHSA about toxicities that they are seeing as a result of illicit drug use. Uh, this is an important sentinel program. It helps us to think through what's happening in the nation and what do we need to be thinking about in terms of what kinds of funds and, re and resources we're going to need to be able to provide to our people as the drug abuse epidemic changes, and change it will. It will not always be opioids. There will be other issues. We cannot, we cannot rest with getting opioid services in place. So the Drug Abuse Warning Network is a hugely important initiative starting now. We also have... Uh, we have the uh, block grants to the states, and this is a long-standing program, Substance Abuse Prevention and Treatment Block Grants. $1.86 billion goes to the states. The states use that money. You can use it in the state for opioid services, but also for other types of substance use disorders and needed prevention services. And we have uh, changes to our National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Surveillance, as I said, is part of our plan. Uh, we are adding questions to our survey so that we can better understand what's going on with, with Americans uh, and substances in this country as, and mental health issues as well. Um, we have uh, new collaborations at SAMHSA. We work very closely with states, but also stakeholder groups. Um, I'm even talking with philanthropists. I like to talk to them about what we're doing and what the money that they want to donate to their communities could be used to kind of complement what we are doing at a federal level. No need to, to repeat services, right? There's plenty of need. So this is kind of a new initiative for us, but we have found that there are, there are those who want to contribute to their communities. We're always happy to talk to them. We also are, are really focusing on rural America. We know that rural America has been very hard hit 
by the opioids crisis. And so we have, uh, we have initiatives in a number of areas that SAMHSA works in with uh, partners throughout the federal government. One of those areas is telehealth. Telehealth to provide direct services to rural areas uh, and telehealth to provide training and mentoring we're, we're to, uh, to staff working in those rural areas. We're working with the Drug Enforcement Administration right now on revisions to telehealth uh, regulations to make it easier to treat individuals with opioid use disorder uh, it, that, that may be in areas that don't have a lot of providers available to them. So we want to make that, that possible for, for folks in rural areas. We have uh, technology transfer centers for substance abuse prevention and treatment as well as mental health. Those resources um, uh, are, are being combined with the um, U.S. Department of Agriculture. We have at SAMHSA, we have supplemented their cooperative extensions those dollars are to be used to train on opioid use disorder uh, for providers in rural areas as well as for individuals, the public living in those areas. So we have a very strong, new, but strong collaboration with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, we are working with them also on recovery housing. Um, new to me, but I learned that they have uh, a lot of houses around the country that um, they have foreclosed on. Who knew Department of Agriculture has a mortgage program? Um, but apparently they do. So, um, so we are working with them. We've just announced, and you, you may not have heard this, but a few weeks ago we announced a memorandum of, of, of agreement with the Department of Agriculture so that, so that our dollars, SAMHSA dollars that go to states, can be used to rehabilitate these these properties to turn them into recovery housing because we know that housing is so important and so needed by individuals recovering from opioid use disorder. So we're excited about that program. It's just now being launched. Uh, we also are working collaboratively with USDA on the development of mobile units that can, can de deliver substance abuse treatment services to rural areas. USDA, their funds can be used to purchase uh, hardware. So in this case, it would be a mobile unit and SAMHSA dollars through SOR, for example, can be used to staff those mobile units so that we can get services to rural areas that are in such great need. Uh, we also uh, are working on community recovery supports, our peer programs, placing peers in emergency departments, putting them in communities to follow up with individuals with opioid use disorder who need their support and assistance. And we are engaging faith-based communities as well in terms of recovery supports and recovery housing. We are working on uh, HIPAA and 42 CFR, uh, better aligning these uh, these privacy statutes, and uh, also uh, SAMHSA did a, uh, an advisory with the Office of Civil Rights to explain to emergency settings that it is not a violation of HIPAA, and certainly not a violation of 42 CFR, to tell families when a loved one has had an overdose and been treated in an emergency room setting. That's not treatment for substance use disorders, that's in a medical emergency emergency and families need to be communicated with when that happens and HIPAA allows that. Healthcare practitioner training and preparation is a very important part of what we do at SAMHSA. Uh, we have put a number of things in place, the STR, technical assistance and training grants. This is putting in every state. Every state has a team of practitioners who have experience in the care and treatment of opioid use disorder to help communities within each state. The reason we did that is because we know every state is different. And so that's one new program. We have another new program. Um, Jim, you, this, you might like this program. This is PCSS Universities. Um, so, it's, so I come from academic medicine. I've spent my whole career in academic medicine prior to coming to SAMHSA and uh, just have done a lot of training in, in the area of addiction medicine, addiction psychiatry. Uh, I believe that we should graduate practitioners who are eligible to get the data waiver 
having met the educational criteria, criteria to do so, so that they don't have to do this later in their careers when it can be hard to get those hours together to be able to do it. Not impossible, but more of a challenge. So why not, why not embed this in pre-graduate training? And by the way, we need to mainstream addiction treatment into programs. No one should graduate without having had training on the addictions. They are so prevalent. What more, what more do we need to show than the data from the NISDA survey on the number of Americans with these disorders who struggle, struggle to get care and treatment? So, PCSS universities, uh, we made our first uh, awards last year. We provide funding to schools to pay for providing the data waiver training. And we'll continue to do that. We also are encouraging recognition of a national certification for the peer workforce uh, so that we, we hope that states will recognize a peer certification in one state and another state rather than asking people to repeat training. So that's another area we're working on. We also um, are going to be providing some funding to establish uh, training on recognition and treatment of substance use disorders in all healthcare professional programs. Most people with a substance use disorder are not gonna walk into an office like mine. I'm an addiction specialist, I'm a physician. Most people with a substance problem are gonna first be seen by a different kind of provider, be it a nurse, be it, be it a pharmacist, be it a social worker, be it a, a nurse practitioner, a physician assistant. All of them need to have some basic education Pre-graduate education. It, one of my huge um, initial, one of my huge agenda items is to mainstream the treatment of substance use disorders because they impact all physical and mental health. So we must do that, in my opinion. Um, we're integrating behavioral health care, including opioid use disorder treatment, into primary care and FQHCs. We're working closely with HRSA on that. And we are working, as I mentioned before, on telehealth, including uh, funding more Project ECHO programs uh, to, again, help increase provider education. This is SAMHSA's new approach to technical assistance and training. No more do we only provide funding to our grantees on technical assistance and training needs because the nation needs these resources. And so we have changed the way we do things. We have now uh, an evidence-based practice repository in our policy laboratory. We have a number of national technical assistance and training centers. Uh, two of them are, are, are focused on the opioids issues, the state targeted response to opioids, and the provider's clinical support system for medication-assisted treatment, which we have greatly expanded as well. Um, we also have uh, regional uh, uh, sites that provide both addiction, mental health, and substance abuse prevention technology transfer, including services on implementation. We, I hope you will all take advantage. These are all free. You don't pay anything for this. This is available to anyone. You can ask for uh, technical assistance on a topic and you will get it. And if you don't get it, you should tell us because we're very committed to making this work for the nation. We also have uh, specialized technology transfer centers for uh, Hispanic Latino populations and also for Native American populations. And we have international HIV-focused technology transfer centers. Uh, we have them in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Ukraine, and South Africa as part of the uh, President's Emergency Response for AIDS uh, Relief. So what is need from the states? We need, to work in, uh, we need to have the states work in partnership with us. States need to accurately assess their needs. How much of an opioids problem do they have? Where are your gaps? And how can you address prevention, treatment, and recovery needs of your people? That's a decision y'all are gonna have to make. We can't, at the federal level, make that for you. We do think providing education to youth on the dangers of uh, substance misuse and opioids misuse is something that isn't happening enough. And, and should happen more, so prevention interventions. Uh, first responder training on opioid overdose reversal. Uh, this has been, I think, extremely helpful in saving lives across the country. Um, 
government uh, officials and decision makers need to invest the time to learn about opioid use disorder and evidence-based treatment so that you will not um, hear from people there's too much non-evidence-based treatment in the world of addiction medicine. And uh, sometimes uh, governments can, uh, people in government who don't know the area that well can be uh, swayed by certain arguments that about certain types of treatments, not useful, not useful. There's a standard of care, state officials need to learn it. Uh, as do as do uh, those of us in the federal government. Uh, you should be in the states requiring your prescribers and other healthcare professionals to learn about opioid use disorder and its treatment. We're not gonna get the epidemic under control until there is a concerted effort to do that. Uh, so consider requiring that every eligible practitioner take the data waiver. And by the way, um, just a suggestion, don't use federal funds that you get for, for uh, prevention, uh, treatment and recovery services, for education that we're already providing for free. Just, just a thought, just a thought. Uh, and uh, require use of your PDMP prior to prescribing and periodically thereafter. The PDMP is, 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 a, is a strong resource for helping in clinical decision making around opioids and the use of other controlled substances. You should, we should be requiring evidence-based treatment for opioid use disorder. What is that? Again, medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder plus psychosocial and recovery supports. Be aware that detox alone is not effective for opioid use disorder. Lots of data on this, folks. This is not, this is not an open discussion. This is not we haven't done enough research. Detox alone does not work. I know lots of people want it. I've had many patients tell me that's what they want. If they want it, please, they must get injectable naltrexone. If they've had relapsing disease, and, and we usually don't see people until they've had relapsing disease. If they've had relapsing disease, they don't have a chance in this environment unless they get injectable naltrexone. Please use it. And we would like to see providers receiving SOR money. Uh, if they don't provide medication-assisted treatment themselves, we know that there are a lot of social programs. They must be connected to providers who can provide medication-assisted treatment. That's in the funding announcement. That's a requirement. That's not optional. I really feel like I have to say this strongly. You must use evidence-based care. We cannot stop these deaths until people get evidence-based treatment. You can't detox them and tell them we'll give you support, have a good life. That isn't gonna work. State Medicaid services. I would ask states to consider applying for an 1115 waiver to lift the IMD exclusion on substance use disorders if you think you need that, but particularly for serious mental illness. This is, this is a huge issue, different topic. Maybe you'll invite me back sometime to talk about serious mental illness. I will just say, states, please consider this. It, this is a huge step forward. But these waivers won't be granted unless you have a system in place. So it's not enough to just have inpatient and outpatient. You must have levels of care. Residential, outpatient, intensive outpatient, partial hospital programs, community supports, all of those things are so important to recovery. Um, require that programs receiving funding provide these services and remove any prior authorizations for medication-assisted treatment and remove the arbitrary limits on MAT. I don't know that that's a problem in North Carolina. It remains a problem in some states. And states are gonna have to pay for the cost of treatment services. It costs money to treat substance use disorders, but why should our people be any different than those with other types of physical disorders? Physical health care is essential including the substance use disorder care, care for mental illnesses if they occur, care coordination among providers, medication-assisted treatment, laboratory testing, and by the way, um, take, a, take a look at what you're paying for in terms of your toxicology screening. I would recommend that you consider point-of-service testing. It's very inexpensive. Laboratory testing costing hundreds to, I've even heard, over $1,000 for a test. This is nonsense. 
We shouldn't be paying for it. Psychosocial services need to be available, counseling, motivational interviewing, CBT, contingency management, individual, group, couples therapy, education about the risks of substance use and the involvement of families in treatment. This is a slide that shows, I, I, I brought this because I wanted to show you that in North Carolina you, you, you need more providers of buprenorphine. This is from a, a study that, that, um, that, that looked at the, the number of providers in states by the, the rate of individuals with opioid use disorder. And you can see that, that those below the line are states that, um, that still have a, a need for additional providers for opioid use disorder. Uh, North Carolina is one of them. Uh, states above actually have an excess of uh, treatment slots if providers were to make their treatment services available. Uh, so just a, a way of saying that there, we, have, we have more need uh, in the states uh, right now than, than is available in most states. So what else is coming to assist with the opioids crisis? Let me talk a little bit about some of my um, uh, sister agencies. Uh, we, you can expect to see a national interoperable PDMP in the, in the future and required use of that, widespread adoption of uh, inclusion of the PDMP in electronic health records, uh, defaults in electronic health records to prompt appropriate quantities and guideline concordant prescribing for uh, controlled substances, including prescription opioids, uh, blister packaging of opioids with what would be the typical number and dose of pills for a particular particular indication. This was something that Scott Gottlieb was very, very keen on and uh, is moving forward at FDA. Uh, research, NIH, as I mentioned, analgesics without abuse liability, non-opioid alternatives, naloxone formulations, uh, Dr. Collins very much all, all over this and Dr. Volkow as well. Uh, and payment policies to expand access to opioid alternatives and support multidisciplinary team-based care for pain management. We are working with CMS on those issues right now. Uh, a few things that I think are positive. Uh, we, see, we see declines in prescription pain reliever misuse in all age groups in the United States. The numbers are still too high, but they are at least moving in the right direction. Uh, this is uh, showing you that we have a significant decline in uh, pain reliever misusers and those uh, with pain reliever use disorder, although we don't see any, any significant change in the number of new misusers of pain reliever. Again, this gets to overprescribing. For heroin, there is uh, not a significant change in the number of users and the number with use disorder, non-significant increase in those with use disorders, but what we saw that was very, very promising, we hope to see this repeated, this is the first time we've seen this in the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, this is a significant drop in the number of new initiates to heroin use. So this was a 52% decline for 2017 compared to 2016. We hope that this will be sustained. And we see significant increases in specialty treatment for illicit drug use disorders, heroin use disorders, opioid use disorders, and cocaine use disorders. Uh, by the way, we are around the country, we are seeing increases in cocaine and methamphetamine use. Uh, so this is going to be a problem that continues to show itself to be very difficult to manage uh, in, in our country. And you can expect to see more of that, I think, in your own patients going forward if you're not seeing it already. But we have some signs of progress, decreases in opioid prescribing since 2011, increases in methadone uh, maintenance treatment, in specialty treatment programs that will offer buprenorphine, offer injectable naltrexone, increases in the number of prescriptions for injectable naltrexone and for buprenorphine products, and dramatic increases in uh, naloxone dispensing from pharmacies, which, um, of course, is a life-saving intervention for a victim of an overdose. So we also are seeing uh, in the 2017 NISDA uh, data, prescription opioid misuse modestly declining over the past decade, heroin use fewer new users, and a modest decline in heroin use in our young adults. Uh, significant increases in the number of people with opioid use disorder getting specialty treatment, uh, plateauing of overdose deaths among commonly prescribed opioids, but continued increases in deaths related to 
uh, opioid products contaminated by illicit potent opioids such as fentanyl. Some states are seeing a leveling off of opioid deaths, others are still seeing increases. So we watch it closely at, C at CDC. Um, so the opioid uh, epidemic continues to evolve. Um, the Trump administration is all over this. We are doing, I think, everything we can, although if you have suggestions, I'm happy to hear them. Uh, we are very open to hearing about how our resources are working in communities and if anything, we can do better to help you. Um, one more thing, I've just decided that whenever I get the chance, I'm gonna talk about this. Um, marijuana. Marijuana is sort of the, the you know, we see more states legalizing. Uh, 36 states, I think, now have medical marijuana. But here's what, here's what doesn't get talked about very much, but I'm gonna talk about it as much as I possibly can. We see adverse outcomes, particularly in our children. Poor school performance, increased dropout rates, chronic use in adolescence linked to a decline in IQ that may not reverse even when they stop using marijuana. Use in adolescence associated with an increased risk of psychotic disorder in adulthood. Uh, marijuana use linked to an earlier onset of psychosis for youth known to be at risk for schizophrenia. Significant numbers, we estimate about 10% of people that try marijuana will become addicted. Higher overall rates of car crashes in states that have legalized. And uh, the association of marijuana use with abuse of prescription pain medications. Marijuana is not, a, it, it, it doesn't stop opioid abuse, it actually contributes to it. Uh, marijuana and pregnancy, this is very, very troubling. We see significant increases in marijuana use by pregnant women, but we also know it is associated with fetal growth restrictions, stillbirths, preterm births, neurological problems in, in the children that are born to women that use marijuana during pregnancy, including attention deficit disorder, uh, deficits in cognitive function, and some states putting in statute that marijuana is a treatment for opioid use disorder. I just ask you, does this look like a treatment for opioid use disorder? If you think it is, please don't tell me because it'll just get me upset. <laughs> I'll stop there. Thank you very much.